Hello and welcome to the 2021 edition of the State of the Union organized by the European University Institute in Florence. My name is Luigi Narbone. I'm director at the Middle East Directions Program here at EUI, and I'm delighted to introduce the panel Engaging Iran, European Transatlantic Perspective on the JCPOA and Security in the Gulf. Joining us today for, for discussion is Ms. Marina Sereni, Italy's Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Said Kazim Sajampur, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Iran and President of the Institute for Political and International Studies in Tehran, Barbara Slevin, Director of Future Iran of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council in the US, and Jost Ilterman, MENA Program Director of the International Crisis Group. For those of you who are participating via the digital platform, please open the live discussion tab in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Here you can submit your questions for the speakers in the Q&A tab, but also you can post comments in the live chat. And last but not least, please use the hashtag SOU2021 if you want to tweet about the session. And now before starting the panel discussion, I would like to pass the floor to Paolo Magri, Vice President of the Italian Institute for International Political Studies, who is co-organizing with us today, the panel. Thank you. And Paolo, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Luigi, and many thanks to the European University Institute and to the State of the Union for this uh, warm cooperation. <clears throat> It's a pleasure to open this timely conversation on the future of the nuclear agreement and more broadly on U.S.-Iran relations. As you know, the panel is organized by ROMED, the joint initiative of the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and ISPI, which is now in its seventh edition and which this year will be held on November 4 to 6 in a hybrid format. As I was saying, this panel happened in a crucial moment. Negotiation between Iran and the other signatories have finally resumed and underway in Vienna. And we hope that a negotiated solution will be found given the need of stability in the region. It is in the recent interest of all countries involved in the negotiation. It's also in the interest of Italy, which has always been advocating for dialogue in the region. But on this note, uh, I'm I'm very happy to leave the floor to Marina Sereni, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, for her introductory remarks. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, everybody. Your Excellencies, uh, Minister Sajapur, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished panelists. It is a pleasure for me to intervene in this webinar. Uh, once again, the Med Dialogue Initiative provides a unique framework for an in depth analysis on current and future challenges in the broader Mediterranean region. Let me thank the Institute for International Political Studies and the European University Institute for organizing this event in the context of the State of the Union Initiative. This seminar tackles the delicate and crucial perspective of regional security in the Gulf, and in particular, the JCPOA uh, that we do consider one of its main pillars. Allow me to briefly recall what the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action is in our view. We consider the JCPOA a key element of the global non-proliferation architecture, as well as an achievement of multilaterally, multilateralism and multilateral diplomacy endorsed by the UN Security Council Resolution 2231. The JCPOA was agreed in order to ensure that Iran's nuclear program remained exclusively peaceful in return for the comprehensive lifting of related UN multilateral and national sanctions. Uh, under the monitoring of the International Atomic Agency, the JCPOA has proved its effectiveness. Preserving the JCPOA is crucial, not only in terms of nuclear non-proliferation, but also for the security of the region. Therefore, the intention to return to the deal and to its full compliance, stated respectively by the Biden administration and Iran, is highly welcomed. 
The new UHAS approach also marks an extremely positive realignment between the two sides of the Atlantic on this crucial topic. The substantive discussions in Vienna among the JCPOA participants and separately with the United States represents a very important development aimed to find a diplomatic solution to restore the nuclear deal and ensure Iran's return to full compliance with the JCPOA. We are convinced that this is the right track. The road is still long, but the only solution lies in diplomacy. All sides should preserve the space for these discussions and any action that could increase tensions and derail this positive process must be avoided in this critical juncture. The sequencing of measures to be adopted in order to revitalize and restore the JCPOA is certainly one of the most sensitive issue, issues at stake. Nevertheless, an effective dialogue needs to be matched with Iran's clear manifestation of political will to fully comply with the obligations arising from the JCPOA. Unfortunately, some recent decisions regarding the Iranian nuclear program can jeopardize the constructive spirit, which is essential for progress in negotiation. Uh, in this context, the EU is playing a visible and firm role in safeguarding the deal. Italy fully supports the efforts of the EU High Representative as JCPOA coordinator with all relevant partners. Further, EU engagement in the context of the renew cooperate, review cooperation among EU, US and Iran may significantly contribute to address major obstacles. The JCPOA crisis, as we all know, falls within a fragile environment characterized by volatility and tensions. In fact, we are all, as member, members of the international community, seriously concerned by the situation in Yemen, which is deteriorating day by day, by the persisting instability and insecurity in Iraq, by the ongoing crisis in Syria, and by the low intensity maritime confrontation in the Gulf. We are convinced that the resumption of a constructive interlocution between Iran and the US would certainly have a positive impact on all these contexts since it, it would remove a substantial source of mistrust among key players. Bearing that in mind, we believe that the revitalization of this dialogue should be, at this stage, the focus and the priority of diplomatic action. Moreover, we acknowledge encouraging signal, signals of a possible positive dynamic in the area. On one side, the reconciliation within the Gulf Cooperation Council sets the conditions for a renewed collaboration among countries of the Arabian Peninsula. On the other side, the Arab Abraham agreements open up new perspective for dialogue and collaboration among regional actors. More recently, we have been also observing encouraging attempts to resume interlocution between Iran and the Arab monarchies of the Gulf. All the developments I have mentioned before must be read not only in terms of regional proximity, but also in terms of shared interests. Instability, sustainable resource management, freedom and security of trade and navigation, response to global challenges, starting from the fight against the pandemic. Re-establishing mutual confidence is the key to face problems and to take advantage of opportunities that go far beyond the national borders, cultural differences, and religious distinctions. In the long term, it could also contribute to make progress on a comprehensive regional security framework in the Gulf. In this vein, a full return to the JCPOA would represent an injection of trust and goodwill, which is extremely important for creating the conditions for a more stable and structured dialogue in the area. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Minister Sereni. Uh, we can now move to the panel discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, as in the, we heard in the introductory remarks, uh, indeed, we are uh, witnessing a, a, a 
very uh, volatile situation after the US withdrew from the JCPOA in 2018 and launched the maximum pressure campaign, we have seen an increase in the Gulf uh, insecurity in the Gulf region. There has also been a resumption of uh, Iran nuclear activities coupled with escalatory dynamics in the regions. And we have seen uh, uh, some degree of disalignment in the, between the, the EU and the US in the policies towards Iran. The election of Joe Biden seemed to have brought diplomacy back to the fore. The US has stated its intention to revive the JCPOA and it's, uh, there, there is a newfound transatlantic cooperation engaging Iran on both the nuclear dossier and on the regional security. We are seeing the first sign of progress in the ongoing JCPOA talks in Vienna and discussion focuses on uh, the sequences of US and Iranian full return to the JCPOA, but also on how to disentangle the nuclear file from the broader regional security issues. So we have a very distinguished panel today for our conversation and also to bring us uh, some uh, European, Iranian and uh, US perspective on, on these issues. And I would start with Jost uh, Hildeman uh, asking uh, um, more specifically on the JCPOA talks in Vienna. They seem to be proceeding well and there is some degree of optimism that they may be reach uh, an agreement. How do you see the prospect of the talks and what is the role of Europe in the revival of the nuclear deal? Yes, please. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Narbonne, and thank you to, to Paolo Magri, of course, uh, and, and to ISPI and the European Institute for, for inviting uh, me to participate in this panel. Um, uh, I would not characterize the talks as going, as proceeding well. I would say they're proceeding. Um, and um, and that, that is already, a great thing, I should say, but um, I don't think it's it's going particularly fast, uh, or there is now a, a real prospect of a, uh, a quick uh, resolution um, and, and a return to the nuclear deal. Um, I think the United States uh, side would argue that the Iranians uh, are slowing things down, maybe because of the Iranian elections in June. Uh, it's not really clear. Uh, Barbara may have another uh, view or a view from Washington on that. Um, and I think from the Iranian side, uh, the Americans are not offering enough in terms of sanctions relief. Uh, they're offering, they've, they've broken up the sanctions in three parts, sanctions that can be lifted, sanctions that can be discussed to be lifted, and sanctions that cannot be lifted. And I think the Iranians are only interested in discussing the sanctions that cannot be discussed to be lifted. So there is a clear uh, problem there. Um, as for the European role, well, the Europeans um, have a been a critical part of the, of the original talks that led to the JCPOA in 2015. Um, but in a way, it's also a bystander role because uh, the, the real confrontation is between the United States and Iran. Um, and because these are indirect talks in Vienna, uh, the Europeans are essentially carriers of messengers. And whenever they are in a any, any party is in a position like that, it's inefficient. Uh, and miscommunications can happen, and in fact have happened in this case. So, um, so that, that is not good. But I do think that the Europeans are quite eager uh, for the uh, talks to succeed, uh, and perhaps, and we can talk about it later, I think, to, uh, to, to uh, lead to, to talks on further issues, uh, an expanded JCPOA or JCPOA 2.0, uh, and maybe a JCPOA plus, which goes into the regional uh, issues as well. The Europeans certainly are interested in that. But uh, for now, the priority should be to focus on the deal that existed in 2015 and reviving it. Thank you, Joost. Um, Dr. Sajapur, perhaps we can hear some uh, Iran's perspective on, on, on this. Um, uh, are you hopeful that the Vienna talks can produce uh, a, a, an agreement in time to meet also Iran's deadline? And what are your views about possible obstacles? Is, uh... Is it connected? There are problems? Okay, let, let's move on and then we, we go back to Dr. Sajapur. Uh, perhaps I, I'll move to, to Barbara Slevin uh, on uh, 
on the debate on the JCPOA in the US. Uh, of course, we, we know that uh, it's also, there is quite uh, an important bipartisan opposition to, to the current talks on the JCPOA. And how do you, do you see any danger that this may derail uh, the revival of the nuclear deal? And uh, what scenarios could then, then this uh, open? Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be on, on this panel. Uh, uh, at the Atlantic Council, of course, we focus on what US and Europe can do together. So the JCPOA, I think, is a perfect example of, of that. Um, there is some democratic opposition to the JCPOA, but I, it is not a, a majority view by any means. And uh, the issue of the Iran nuclear deal, it's actually become more popular in the United States uh, over the last four years. If you look at the opinion polls, uh, majorities of Americans support this agreement uh, because the, uh, the Trump uh, withdrawal and the maximum pressure campaign are perceived to have failed. Uh, quite decisively. So I don't think this is a major factor. There, there are some efforts by Republicans uh, with a few Democrats to, to try to perhaps uh, put in some amendments to legislation that would require the administration to uh, report to Congress. Uh, uh, but the way the deal is structured, it really can be re-entered by the United States through executive orders alone. Um, I think the problem really now is more on the Iranian side, and uh, Yus Tilterman mentioned the upcoming elections. There seems to be some debate going on whether it is in Iran's advantage to uh, have the deal restored before the June 18 presidential elections or afterward, uh, concern that somehow an, a quick return would benefit the so-called reformist pragmatist camp uh, in Iran. Uh, and would, would hurt the chances of hardliners to completely consolidate power in that country. So I think that's part of the, the problem. Obviously, the Iranians, by insisting on indirect talks, have slowed everything down. And there are also reports that their disagreements over some of the advanced centrifuges that Iran has installed uh, and whether they all have to be removed. So I think the issue is not just the sanctions and, and the buckets of sanctions, but also on the nuclear side as well. However, uh, the talks are proceeding and uh, they can speed up if, uh, if there is a political will on, on both sides. So I remain optimistic. I think there is an understanding that the return to the original JCPOA is basically the baseline for anything that is to follow. Uh, we have seen some encouraging developments, and I think, uh, Professor Naboni, you mentioned it in terms of the, the regional conversations going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Iraq, uh, other discussions between the UAE and Iran, the return of Qatar to the GCC fold, and just a, a general sense that, um, that players there recognize that the Biden administration is not going to be the 911 every time there is an incident. Uh, and that they need a relaxation of tensions and they need to do this on their own with the support of the international community. Thank you, Dr. Slavin. And uh, as you uh, introduced the issue of, of the broader regional uh, scene, I think I'd like to, Dr. Sajapur apparently has some, still some connection problems, so we can uh, perhaps proceed uh, with our conversation. I will go back to Jost Hilterman and just ask him, uh, how do you see the, the possibility of opening broader regional talks? And uh, is there a role for uh, European countries, as we know that they may be uh, facilitators uh, in initiating such, uh, such a process? Uh, how do you see that? Uh, thank you, Luigi. I think, I think there is a, an opportunity, of course, uh, to broaden the, the talks or broaden them to build on top of a revived JCPOA to talk about the regional issues. There is also the possibility of starting a regional process even as the JCPOA talks uh, uh, proceed and to have the two processes which should not be linked to be mutually reinforcing. Uh, they could also turn out to be mutually destructive but that is obviously not the aim. Um, but, but to have the two processes, uh, it should also be possible. Um, remember that originally it was Iran that was seeking a grand bargain. 
so it wanted to wrap everything up in one package. It was the United States said, no, that's not going to fly, that's not going to work. So let's uh, carve out the nuclear issue, come to a deal on that, and then we move on. Of course, then when the deal was reached, things fell apart when a new administration came into the White House. Uh, I think now there is a recognition that um, uh, the, the regional dimension cannot be overlooked, uh, that in fact that was a weakness in the original negotiations. Um, and so uh, from the Iranian side, there should be no objection to that, but uh, uh, Dr. Sajid Pu, who has joined, just joined us, can, can, uh, can correct me. Um, um, On what? I, I'm just corrected by technology. I was... <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, Kadam. Nice to see Thank you. you. Uh, glad you could join. I'm just talking about uh, the broader regional talks and, and when they should take place and whether uh, Iran would be would be involved. My, my main concern is, is, is um, you know, it's clear what, what the Arab Gulf states and what uh, Israel want from Iran, but it's not clear to me is what they're willing to give as a quid pro quo. As a, far as the European role, I would say um, it is clear that without a U.S. green light, at least, if not active support, uh, the, the, the Gulf Arab states are not going to uh, engage in, in serious negotiations with Iran. They need that protective umbrella, the guarantee of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that the Europeans couldn't play a highly constructive role in this. And we have been, as cri International Crisis Group, have been pushing for that. Uh, to, to at least have a, a core group of European uh, governments that would uh, kickstart a, a, a Gulf-based uh, inclusive dialogue between the GCC and uh, Iraq and Iran. Um, and uh, this is still in, in um, you know, initial stages, but it's being discussed, including in Washington, fortunately, uh, also between Washington and the UN, certainly at, in European capitals. So things are moving, but um, I think we have a long way to go. And the question again is, sh should it start now? My view is yes. Uh, or should it wait until the JCPOA is back in place? I would say, um, yeah, that's possible, but not preferred. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jost. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Sajapur. We're, I'm good glad afternoon. you managed uh, to, to overcome uh, technological problems and you are here with us uh, today. We started already the discussion and we'd also like to hear your views. And perhaps, as you see, the discussion has already moved to, to broader regional uh, uh, issues, but uh, let's go back for a second to the JCPOA proper and, uh, and I'd like to hear your views about uh, the, the prospects uh, of the talks and how do you see them? And uh, also in view of, uh, of Iran's deadlines, the elections uh, uh, upcoming, and what do you think could be the possible obstacles uh, from an in Iranian point of view? Uh, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure to see uh, friends and colleagues and sorry for uh, a very uh, technical problem, but uh, your staff were so good and adept and they could, uh, by using different tricks, uh, solve it. Uh, and uh, really they need appreciation. Uh, but with respect to what you asked, I think, uh, uh, of course, I give my per personal view and it's not the official view. Uh, I think the prospect uh, uh, is uh, somehow showing uh, movement to, uh, let's say, a better uh, positioning. Uh, if I'm correct, uh, reading the situation, we have three stages uh, in uh, the negotiation that's going on. One is, uh, let's say, debating what to do. Uh, and I think it, uh, and how to start, what to do, what should be the agenda, and I think it took a long time, but uh, it worked. So debate is over. Second, I think uh, Sage was drafting. And when you know when you enter uh, the le the drafting period, it means debate has moved. Uh, and I think uh, still this drafting, uh, uh, let's say, a Sage needs to be uh, polished. But I think uh, it's going on. Uh, however, there is a further stage, and that is decision to implement. And I think uh, this is where uh, there are, let's say, uh, psychological barriers, there are political barriers. But however, it depends on the political will 
uh, of uh, uh, all sides, but I think mostly United States. Don't forget that the US withdraw from JCPOA. And I think uh, uh, there was a type of a sluggish process of, let's say, rejoining through uh, uh, still not uh, US has not rejoined. But I think this is sluggish process, uh, debating, having different narratives and so on. So, so forth has uh, takes, uh, taken some time. But uh, I think personally, I'm not, uh, uh, let's say, pessimistic, uh, though optimism requires more work to be done. But the obstacles, I think, are of maybe different natures. One is this technicality of drafting, you know, and making decisions, but the position of Iran is clear. Uh, I think that uh, the sanctions should be uh, lifted, that the U.S. Uh, should return. There should be verif verification of the sanction relief. And simple, I mean, the, the Iranian position, I think, is very clear and simple. JCPOA. Nothing less, nothing more. Clear. So I think overall, uh, I hope I didn't uh, consume so much time. I remain uh, optimistic personally. That, that, that is good to hear. There are optimistic views and the process, as we know, is, is complex. Uh, Perhaps uh, I would now move to uh, uh, Dr. Zlevin and, and uh, just to, to return on the broader regional questions. Uh, um, what, what steps has the Biden administration taken to manage uh, allies concerns, and particularly Israel and Saudi potential or, or spoken, outspoken opposition to the JCPOA? Um, well, thank you again. It's a pleasure to see uh... Kazem Sajapur also uh, on the screen. Um, the Biden administration has been very methodical in its consultations, obviously first working with Europeans and getting on the same page with them, uh, but it's also been very solicitous of Israeli views and of Arab views, uh, uh, but uh, I think in a way that does not give anyone veto power over the US decision to return to, to the deal. If, uh, if the, the technicalities can, can all be finalized. And, uh, you know, uh, we saw this with the sort of hands-off treatment that um, President Biden gave Bibi Netanyahu. He waited many weeks uh, before he called him after his inauguration. Uh, he uh, has given a cold shoulder to Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. But um, at the same time, uh, he appointed an envoy for Yemen, who has been working very hard, shuttling around, trying to to uh, to de-escalate that terrible conflict. Um, there are reports that, of course, Bill Burns was in Baghdad and had some interesting meetings there. Uh, our former uh, uh, deputy secretary of state, now the head of, of the CIA, um, we have uh, had others who've gone to Lebanon. Uh, certainly there have been consultations with Iraq. So I think that the administration has, has been very active. It's also expressed support for the Abrahamic Accords uh, and the, the willingness of Arab countries to recognize Israel. Uh, but at the same time, none of these countries have veto power. They're consulted. Uh, but they don't get to, to tell the Biden administration what to do. And I think this is a very healthy restoration of U.S. sovereignty, if I may say so. Right. Thank you. And, uh, and staying on, on the same uh, issue of re regional diplomacy moving, uh, I would like to return to Dr. Sajapur and, and ask, we have been reading reports about uh, Iran-Saudi uh, talks, uh, the intelligence level, uh, that's, can, can this lead to a resumption of diplomatic uh, relations between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran? And, and then bro more broadly, how do you see the prospects for regional talks uh, in uh, not too distant future as we started to discuss? Uh, uh, it's a very good question. Actually, on the, the talks, I cannot comment because uh, of, uh, I mean, many issues related to this. But I think on the prospect, uh, 
you have to take into account that the Iranian uh, position is clear. And I think this clarity helps uh, us uh, uh, for getting a picture of what we want to really uh, uh, do. And I think uh, we have been for regional uh, dialogue for a long time. We have, our foreign minister has been uh, insisting on uh, uh, paragraph, uh, operative paragraph number eight of resolution 598 of Security Council, which uh, uh, clears actually the way for a regional uh, dialogue. Uh, and uh, the United Nations uh, Secretariat is aware of the Iranian position. They have been in touch on, on this issue. Uh, and I think uh, on many occasions, Iran has expressed its willingness for regional dialogue. And for this, I think there is a very interesting uh, uh, phenomenon you have to take into account. And it is the bilateral side of the issues. And now you have Iranian bilateral, a very excellent relationship with Oman. You have a good relationship with uh, Kuwait. You know why negotiation in Vienna was going on last week. Our foreign minister was in, in Kuwait, was in Oman, was in uh, uh, Qatar, was in Iraq. So I think the pillar of any regional dialogue is uh, uh, bilateral in a way. And I think the more bilateral that we have, the better. I think the uh, Saudi-Iranian bilateral also can be a very interesting pillar of this regional uh, dialogue. Uh, and I, I, I'm uh, uh, thinking that uh, nothing is an obstacle for, let's say, uh, this bilateral uh, dialogue uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia. If, uh, I mean, you look at the picture, you see that the interest of uh, both countries is in a, a type of uh, connecting on, on this issue. So to put it firstly, I think uh, bilateral plus the uh, international uh, United Nations base uh, is very, let's say, or the basis that they can make us uh, thinking of a, a regional dialogue. My personal view is that Europe can play a role here. This is my final point. I think how? Let's say uh, by think tank level, uh, you can uh, have a regional, the same format, let's say in 598, uh, 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 started on the think tanking level. And I think good works have been done on uh, regional security, expectations should be uh, managed. And I think the more we have uh, informal, formal, informal, informal, I think what is important is my final word, is to change the psychology from psychology of tension to the psychology of dialogue. And I think it's possible. That is indeed a, a very important uh, change that uh, has to occur, and it seems that, that some some steps uh, are taking place, so that can lead to some to some hope. Now we I would open the, the floor for the uh, questions from uh, from the audience, uh, which I don't uh, see yet, uh, uh, and waiting for those. I would perhaps ask a question to. Uh, all three of you uh, in talking is remaining on, on the regional uh, dimension. Um, what, uh, um, uh, what would be, I mean, is there any, it's very complex, of course, but is there any uh, low hanging fruit, something that uh, could, could help uh, trigger the, the process? Uh, for instance, uh, there has been a talk about Yemen uh, that were, that could be uh, an interesting, uh, 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 focus of, 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 of more uh, diplomacies. Uh, just just to, to listen to you, or if you see any other possibilities to kickstart uh, the discussion on, on some specific issues or areas? Perhaps Dr. Sarabrur, as you huh. start from you this time. Uh, I, I think, yes, uh, the, my own experience suggests that 
words matter and talks, let's say public talks, uh, signaling and messaging on positive toning uh, matter significantly. And I think this is a, a very, very important step. So if you don't use the uh, words against Iran in the pronouncements of our uh, Arab neighbors, uh, if you see uh, hints of, uh, let's say, cooperation, of course, this is where, uh, where I uh, talk about psychology. The psychology of conflict would uh, change. I think there always, there is always a psychological component to any conflict and conflict resolution and a component of psychological uh, package is wording. So wording matters significantly. And I think if you decide not to inflame, uh, let's say uh, the, the rhetorics, if you talk about dialogue, if you talk about cooperation, I think it's not a low hanging fruit. Actually, it is a very significant, but very easily can be achieved. Yes, it, it is indeed important. And uh, we are witnessing at least uh, toning down a little bit of the, of the rhetoric. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Barbara or Jost. Yeah, uh, let me just also mention now that, well, COVID is beginning to subside, at least in some places. Um, we hopefully will see more people-to-people -people engagement. I think there was a, an Iranian uh, soccer team, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, played uh, some matches in, uh, in Saudi Arabia recently. Um, uh, these kinds of things can really be helpful in terms of breaking, breaking barriers, uh, cultural sports exchanges. Uh, I hope to see a resumption of track two dialogue uh, and track 1.5 dialogue. We've, we've not been able to have these meetings in person because of, of COVID and, and we've all really suffered from it as much as these Zoom meetings are, are, are a good substitute. It's not the same thing for being in, in the same room with people. Um, so I, I, and I think we should give credit to, uh, to the Saudi crown prince for toning down his rhetoric uh, in the recent interview that he gave, that was very that was very striking, given the things that he had said about uh, Iran before, and Iran reciprocated also with with conciliatory language. So this is good, but Yemen is uh, is obviously a priority because of the the great human suffering there, and uh, I would hope that Iran would exert uh, some influence with the Houthis to to get them to stop their assault on Marib, um, which is devastating, um, and uh, try to get the parties to the table and get a get a ceasefire. Yes, please. Yeah, so so I, I also want to echo the the, the low hanging fruit the the issue of words. Um, the, the lowering of, of rhetoric is, is uh, really helps lower the temperature as well. In fact, I have a commentary coming out today that is called uh, the headline is uh, from diatribes to dialogue, um, because that, that that is really what it's about as a first step, of, of course. And we have seen, as Barbara said, some really um, constructive steps in that direction in the last uh, week. The. Um, um, I would also say that uh, anything relating to, to uh, COVID, to climate change, there are common interests there that are uh, not such, such hot political issues that can be addressed. I should add to that that you know, Saudi Arabia and Iran know very well how to do this. Um, they have done it in the past, um, even you know, since 1979, not, not only before. And, um, and, and so th they don't need any instruction on this. It is something that they, they know very well how, how, how to do uh, and, and can do. Now, um, is Yemen a good case for, of low-hanging fruit? It's clearly a case that's necessary. I'm not sure it's low-hanging fruit um, because I don't see why Iran would uh, bear on the Houthis to uh, find a political solution in Maghreb when the Houthis are about to take the place. Um, uh, that's not going to end the war. Uh, it, in fact, it may make talks uh, even more a remote possibility, but and so that's terrible for Yemen. But um, I, I find it hard to believe that uh, the Houthis would seize their military effort when it's so close to succeeding. 
um, and I say this with great regret, the, um, because it will ca cause a humanitarian disaster. There's no question about it. Um, but so is it, is it a good case of low-hanging fruit? The only thing is that Saudi Arabia wants to get out of the war, um, but Saudi Arabia getting out of the war will not end the war. Um, so um, uh, this, this is going to take more time uh, and, and complex negotiations. In Iraq, um, there have been altercations between the United States and uh, paramilitary groups, uh, some of which have links to Iran. The, um, uh, can, this, can this improve? Well, until recently, that hasn't. And I assume that's linked to the nuclear talks in some way or to whatever domestic agenda some of these groups have in Iraq. Um, there's also Bahrain, there is Lebanon, there is Syria. There are issues where uh, it is possible to lower the temperature. Um, but um, I would go back again to first we need a, a sort of a, a, a rhetorical cooling uh, and then and then move on to some concrete issues and leave it to the two sides to to figure out the best way forward. Yes, th thank you. I will just uh, to mention uh, we we have uh, uh, an upcoming uh, conference at the Med Directions uh, talk discussing about uh, uh, just those uh, aspects. Uh, on the 20th, the 21st of May, uh, uh, it's titled Where Do We Start? Designing uh, Steps Toward the Regional Security System in the Gulf. And it's actually, uh, it is, uh, we have also uh, an upcoming ebook uh, the, over the next week or so, uh, just to look at what specific uh, small steps could be taken by countries in the region to advance uh, in, in, in towards a, a, a sustainable regional security system. So we, we welcome everybody to, to, uh, to our, to our uh, conference as well. And I have a question for uh, Dr. Sajampur uh, from, the, from the audience. Um, around which strategic issues could Iran and Italy de develop a partnership? And do you think that eventual removal of the US sanctions may, may strengthen the relationship between the two countries? Very good question. Actually, I had uh, in mind uh, to have two more points. Uh, and one point was about the role of Italy. Uh, I think before going to Iran-Italy relationship, I think uh, nobody can underestimate the role of Italy in creating a space for discussion, uh, for, let's say, cooling down for creative ideas. Because Italy has a great respect in our country and in the region. And since Italy uh, is not, has not been involved in imperial designs in, in our surrounding and also a good historical relationship. So the role of uh, uh, Ipsy, uh, Med Dialogue and these settings are great. So I think, uh, this is uh, uh, in the context of the, let's say, regional dialogue. And now on uh, Iranian uh, Italy, I think, first of all, this is a historical relationship. And it has been a very friendly relationship, even during the very difficult times. Uh, so this can be uh, strengthened. I think sanctions somehow impacted this relationship. Uh, not in the terms of the spirit of Italians or Iranians to work together, in terms of making uh, some impediments by the Americans. But I think uh, Italy, even in this regard, can uh, be a vanguard uh, because I, I know that uh, Italy, the, even during the, even the difficult times uh, through its uh, SMEs and uh, small companies really try to, to help. Now I think, there, I hope there would be a better situation uh, so there is a strategic point in Iran interrelationship. And when we talk about Iran and Italy, it's not just a bilateral. It has, I think, regional implications. It has European uh, continental uh, implication. So it's uh, great. Now, my final point, I think the role of Iraq also should be appreciated in any re regional dialogue. First, I think Iraq is a part of any regional uh, negotiation. In the past, there was a tendency in some of the uh, Arab states to ignore Iraq. I think if you want to have a regional dialogue, uh, Iraq should be taken more seriously. And I think Iraq has a great capacity, uh, potentiality, and also desire uh, to act. And I think uh, furthermore on 
reducing tension in the Iraq can really play a significant role. Thank you, Dr. Sajandu. I have another question for Barbara Slavin, and uh, it's uh, uh, interesting. As I said, it's what is the, if the next U.S. president withdraws again from the? Uh, yeah. Well, look, it's a legitimate uh, question, and uh, obviously, none of us anticipated that we would get a Trump administration that would pull out of the JCPOA so quickly. Um, there are no guarantees in this world. I mean, uh, Iranian policies can change, American policies can change. I think the best guarantee is a swift return to the original deal, uh, strict compliance on all sides, uh, and, a, and a diminution in tension uh, in the region, and also, frankly, bilaterally between the United States and Iran. Uh, a, a release of hostages, of prisoners, uh, a refraining from arresting more innocent Americans uh, and dual nationals, which has done a lot of damage to Iran's image in the United States, going back to the original hostage, hostage crisis of 1979 to, to 81. And uh, frankly, I think the time is long overdue for a restoration of normal diplomatic relations between the United States and Iran, both countries have been hurt by the lack of official channels, by having to go through go-betweens. Uh, the Swiss are wonderful, but it's not a substitute for direct relations. The taboos were broken by the original JCPOA talks. We had Javad Zarif and John Kerry negotiating. So uh, let's build on this and let's, let's have a proper relationship that allows us to tackle other difficulties, including the primary US sanctions, which have deprived uh, Iranians of many wonderful US products uh, over, over the years. Um, that's my personal view. Uh, I'm not sure if politically it can fly in Tehran, but I think it's about time. Thank you. And uh, we have one last question. I think time is, is running out for, for uh... Jost Hilterman um, and uh, concerns the uh, why they do uh, Middle East regional uh, powers do so firmly object to the JCPOA and what can be done perhaps to, to smoothen some of these objections. That is. Well, I, I think uh, there is a difference uh, between Israel on the one side and the uh, Gulf Arab states on the other when it comes to the importance of the JCPOA. For Israel, uh, uh, they see the Iranian nuclear threat as something that is directly directed at Israel and it threatens them. Um, and uh, rightly or wrongly, but that is the perception. And uh, so they, they need to, they focus on the JCPOA. Of course, in addition to that, they're also concerned about Iran's uh, regional uh, uh, power projection, uh, its missile, cap the conventional missile capability, uh, and its use of allies, uh, uh, non-state actors in the region. For the Gulf Arab states, it is mostly the latter. It's the, um, the, the regional power projection that is the most threatening in their perception. Uh, uh, from the Iranian side. And um, so for them, uh, the JCPOA talks uh, miss the point. Um, they, they don't, they, I mean, they wouldn't like Iran to have a nuclear weapon, but that's not their, their, they don't think Iran will get it anyway because the United States will block them or Israel will block them. Um, for them, it is, why aren't you also talking about this issue that directly threatens us, uh, which is uh, what Iran is doing in Yemen and in uh, Iraq and in Syria and in Lebanon and in Bahrain and in the Horn of Africa and ever, everywhere else, wherever they see some, something moving. So um, that, that is the reason. But I think the Saudis and the Emiratis can live with the JCPOA. Um, they just don't want it to end there. And the Israelis, you know, are divided. There is a, in the security establishment, there are quite a few voices that, uh, that, that like the JCPOA, that might want to see an improvement in the JCPOA, um, but, it's, that's, but on the political side, that is an entirely different uh, kettle of fish. And, and then it becomes a, an election issue and a political issue generally that certainly uh, Mr. Netanyahu has exploited to the hilt. Thank you very much. And unfortunately, we come to the end of this very interesting panel. I'm sure we could have continued discussing for another hour or two if so, but uh, that's uh, the time is, is rather strict. And uh, so I thank uh, all the distinguished panelists for contributing to this very lively discussion. And, uh, and I thank, uh, thank uh, everybody for watching us. 
And stay tuned for the next uh, uh, Fringe event, which is titled Trends and Shift in Global Governance and the Role of the EU, featuring the European Strategy and Policy Analysis System and Trigger, and which will start at uh, 1755. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.